I want to pick back up from where we left off this morning in verse 19. Verse 19 of Ephesians chapter 2. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. We celebrated last week the paying off of this building, but uh, afterwards when I was, uh, when we were having a fellowship meal, uh, I got to talking to Glenn Rayburn and his wife, who, who was our builder, and I was telling Glenn, I said, what I remember the most about uh, getting ready to build that, it wasn't the planning, it wasn't the, uh, for him. I was talking to him, and he agreed with me. I said, the most excited I saw you in all the process was the day the slab was poured. And he said, it is. He said, that's always the most exciting part to me in any building is when the slab is poured. Well, the slab represents the foundation, doesn't it? And it is, it is of utter importance that the slab uh, be done correctly. And it's probably, I would say, probably one of the most important parts of our building. And so when we read this scripture, I wanted to come back and catch one part of this because I think it builds up. Sometimes we read the Old Testament, and then we come and read the New Testament, and there's a mindset. Believe it or not, people that really haven't been in church, and I'm not, not cutting them down, but sometimes they don't realize they really believe that there's a God of the Old Testament and there's a different God of the New Testament. They, they've read a little bit of the Old Testament, and they find it to be a very serious, uh, vengeful God, and they come to the New Testament and read a John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And so in their mind, it's almost as if, well, God in the Old Testament is not the same God in the New Testament, but it is the same God. And so uh, one of the things I think it helps us to see sometimes is to start in Genesis, to consider through the Old Testament, to go into the New Testament, the Gospels, which talk about the life of Christ. We have the book of Acts, which is kind of our history book of the New Testament. It kind of tells us about uh, uh, what happened after the resurrection and ascension of Christ and prior to uh, the expansion of churches. If there was no Acts, we wouldn't have any idea. Uh, if that had not been recorded, I mean, there might have been some history, but, but the book of Acts is just a wonderful tie together. <clears throat> and then we have Paul's letters. And one of the things, especially in our study of Ephesians, Paul is giving us a look uh, theologically, historically, but he's tying together so many things for us to understand God's plan has never deviated. It's never deviated. So when I read this, this I want to come back and look at verse 20, especially before we get started tonight about being the temple. Being the temple. Now, I'm going to use, I know the temple, we understand the temple from the Old Testament aspect. Uh, I want us to, to interject the two words for the same, the temple and the church because I think we can, and I'll explain it a little bit more. But getting to that point, we have verse 20. And this is Paul tying the Old Testament and the New Testament, and he's bringing it together for us to understand. And I think it's very important that we understand this. So we, he's talking about the household of God, and then he talks about how this household, and he goes to a building metaphor. He starts talking about a structure, okay? And he says, having built on the foundation, this is God building, we have the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Okay, who do the prophets represent? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. Who do the apostles represent? The New Testament. So, so we have the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, okay? And then it says, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Paul repeats this analogy through many of his letters. Uh, uh, and then when we go and, and learn about this chief cornerstone, it's sort of like our foundation of this building, uh, where they don't pour, where they didn't have poured a slab. One of the most important parts of their buildings would have been the cornerstone. Uh, in essence, our foundation. 
So Jesus anchors the building. Now he was rejected, but God made that person the chief cornerstone. So where the Jewish people rejected Jesus, God made him the most important part of it all, which we know and we'll learn more about this tonight. So we have that. So we have the apostles, the prophets, we have Jesus the cornerstone, and then on top of that it's being built. Well, what is being built? That's the part I want us to see. We are that household. We are that edifice, if you will. That, we are the ones that God is building. And if you want to consider this, think about if you had lived in the time of, of the temple, of the Old Testament temple. And, and let's imagine, like I said, church temple. Let's just imagine this together. It was a place of worship, a place of gathering. Ladies, you wouldn't have been in this place. You would have had to be somewhere else. Uh, only the men were able to come in certain portions of the temple. I understand all that. But let's just think for a minute about the gathering to worship, to hear, to teach, to learn, which would have been everybody, okay? When we think about the church and, and, and what is responsible, if this were the temple and we lived in the days of the temple and you had a task, you had a task, you had a part to make sure the temple functioned. What if, what if it wasn't something that you took seriously? What if it was something that was hit or miss with you? Well, I'll show up on uh, this day, but I'm going to miss the next three, and then I'll show up another. But you have an important part. In the day of the temple uh, uh, and the functionality of the temple, the ones who were responsible for ministering in that, they didn't have that option. Their function is what made the temple function. It was a place where God's presence was. We come to the church today and we've taken this emphasis of the temple part and removed it. And now we've made the church <coughs> a place that is, um, we can gather. We can be here. We don't have to be here. We don't have to have any function. We don't have to have a place. We don't have to have that. But I'm telling you, that's not anywhere in Scripture. That is an unbiblical view of what God is doing in the New Testament church today. So, so I want us to take the idea of this spiritual building of which we are a part, and then it, and Paul's going to expand it even more. But I want to share a few scriptures with you uh, coming to that. Now, 1 Peter, I read this this morning, talking about Jesus. 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. Coming to Jesus as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, so, so the chief cornerstone, foundation, built up apostles and prophets. You also, Peter said, as living stones, that's us, that's us, are being built up unto a spiritual house. So God is building a spiritual temple through Christ in us. That is profound. That is absolutely profound. What is it? A, role, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The Old Testament temple would have been sacrifices. It would have been a, 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 not a ritual, maybe that's not, there was a system. And by that system, people could have covering and they could be right before God, but they had to follow the rules on that. We're being built in, in Romans chapter 12. We offer ourselves a living sacrifice. We don't, we, don't, we don't kill things. Why? We don't have to see their blood. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, folks, in the book of Hebrews, it teaches how Christ is so much better than all those other things. Christ is superior to all those other things. Everything was a type that led up to the ministry of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, I want to look at another scripture real quick. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. There's our function and our purpose. Folks, listen. It's not to have organizations. It's not to have clubs. It's not to do things. It's not, it is for one reason. We are the church for one reason. We've all been called out of darkness into light by God through His grace 
And we are here to proclaim that praise into a lost and dying world. And I, and I want to present to you, do you feel that the church does that adequately today? I'm afraid we don't. If we would spend the time proclaiming God, praising God. Now let me go back. I'm not making, I'm, we're reading exactly what it says. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now you have obtained mercy. The lost world today is, is needing so badly for the church to function as God intended the church to function. And they need genuine believers. They need genuine people building up that building to testify of God, to proclaim the wonderful truths of God, to proclaim praises to Him who called us out of darkness. That's simply our testimony. To let people know that there's a better way. And I'm telling you today, people need that. I read an article this afternoon and it was a it was really it was a moving article but what the article was about was a woman in her in her younger days was very interested in everything spiritual unfortunately that opened her up to everything spiritual uh, 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 anything nature psychology uh, church of science she just absorbed everything she could everything she could read she absorbed and read and studied her goal was to develop a spiritual mind. She wanted a spiritual mind, a connection to the spirit world. She was convinced it was there. So she looked and looked and looked. And in the process, she was opening herself up to things that were dark, but she didn't realize it then. She didn't realize that, okay? She fell into manic depressions, uh, uh, psychiatric breakdowns, and, and, and all kinds of, of issues. Whenever she would go to a psychoanalyst to speak to them, they would ask, because they always do. And matter of fact, a lot of my counseling, I always go back to what I call a trigger. What started it? Where did it begin? Because generally there's a step-off place somewhere that we can identify if we really search the Lord. And we can put that off and put on some good things and usually get back on track. But she said, every time I would never hesitate to tell them that it was my journey for this spiritual mindset she always recognized it as a darkness that she had encountered. Now, she didn't believe in the devil. She did not believe in demons at all. She believed in kind of a, uh, it's called pantheism, that, that basically God exists in everything. So uh, when I see an oak tree, I see God. When I see a kitty cat, I see God. When I see another person, I see God. And so, so that was kind of what her mindset was uh, in, in a theological sense. She also dabbled in Christianity. Isn't that wild? Because it was spiritual. She read her Bible, along with everything else that she could read. And she said one day that God began to show her the truths of Jesus Christ. And she began to realize the oneness in Christ, what God's plan was. And in that, she became a Christian. Now, she still struggles she still has psychological issues. She still goes to a lot of counseling. But she recognized that evil exists. She recognized that there was a literal Satan. She recognized that all these other paths that she thought would lead to God were leading her to darkness. And that's what was causing these breakdowns and these different things. Now, folks, the reason I tell you all that is this world needs genuine Christians. Genuine Christians. Don't act like we know everything. Don't act like we figured it all out. Admit when we fail miserably. Be real to people. They need that so bad. But always point to Christ because he's the only, he's it. There is no other place, folks, that we can go to, okay? Now, taking the Old Testament to the New Testament, let's go back here to the foundational part of the Old Testament. Let's go to the Garden of Eden for just a minute. I'm going to ask you a question. Why? did God create Adam and Eve? Why? <laughs> Some of that we have no idea. I'm just going to admit. But there's evidence and there's enough written that we can understand. Let me say this. God didn't need to create anything. 
God eternally was complete. Him creating us and the world and the universe did not complete God. He was fully functioning, always as being. We can't even think that way because we're finite. But there was a reason that God created. And what was that reason? God had a desire. Praise, I, praise yes. But look, it's, it's, it's more sweeter than that. See, God's not an egotist who exists for us to always say thank you and you're so great. We should because he is. God created man to fellowship with him. That's God's desire. God wants to be with us. Now, folks, when you see that in the garden, and guess what we did? We messed that up, didn't we? Sin separated us from God. We died spiritually. God didn't. God would have been completely justified to say, boop, I'm done. You're gone. That's it. <laughs> None of this other would have ever happened. But it brought into fruition a plan that God had. From the seed of a woman, there would come one that would crush the hill of Satan. And he began then by the illustration of the coverings, <clears throat> of covering them uh, with the animal skins, which meant a life had to be taken. There was an image there of being covered, and it began a process. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. I hope I'm not getting what everybody else has been getting. Now, when we take that in consideration, let's go now to when God chooses a people. Why did he choose Israel? Why did, he choose, why did he call Abraham? Why did he send Abraham? Why did he ask Abraham or command Abraham? But why did he do that? Because he wanted to fellowship. He wanted to fellowship. And I have a scripture that I want to read you guys, but I know I'll never find it because I've written so many down. Yes, I did write it. Leviticus chapter 26. This is, this is in the Old Testament this is a covenant God made with Israel. Listen to this, 26, 11, 12. I will put my dwelling among you. Then he comes back and says, I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. What do y'all see in that? God desires to be with us. He wants that. He wants that, okay? Now, let's go to the wilderness wanderings. God called Moses to lead the people out. God, specifically at a period of time, he always has a period of time. And he always has the one to lead, too. So Moses, as they led the people, obviously, he, they could have gone right into the promised land, but because of, of, of rebellion and disbelief and unbelief of what God said, they wandered, didn't they? But in the wilderness, what did God give them? They, they tabernacled in the wilderness. In other words, they tented. So that was their livelihood for 40 years. So what did God do who desired to be with them? He gave them instructions to build him a tent. It was a tabernacle of the wilderness. That's what it was. Why? So he could be with them. I want you to see this. This has always been God's plan to be with his people. And you can even go so far as when they were in their wilderness wanderings. God led them by a pillar of fire and a cloud, he, and a cloud of fire. He led, he led them by his presence because he wanted to be with them. Okay? Let's go to the New Testament. Same God, nothing changing, but something did change. What happened now? In the fullness of time, God sent forth who? His son, Jesus. What was, what was the name the angel said he would be known as? Emmanuel. What did Emmanuel mean? God with us. Do you see, nothing ever changed, folks. God was working toward this. That's the foundation of the prophets, the foundation of the apostles, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. This has been God's desire all along. Now, it, it gets it gets real wild here. I want to read a few scriptures to you about this because it's all throughout our New Testament. Now, Ephesians, where we kind of started with this, verse 22 says, In whom you also, these are believers, are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now, you is a plural in the Greek. And it's referencing the church 
But what is the church made of? Individuals. Individuals. So keep those two things in mind. Let's read a few more. Read a few more. I think I already read this first one. John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Mm. I had my brother come and have lunch with us today. We sat down in our home. We took plates and we put food on them. We had fellowship because we were together in one place in our home. You guys understand that? We understand what it means to be home. Now, let's read this again. We will come to him and make our home with him. Well, where on earth would that be? Is it in our backyard? <laughs> Is it in McNeil? Where does God make his home in us and with us? Where would that be? It's us, folks, us. And lest we don't quite see that, let's go to Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 3. Now, let me just say something. We fix to come across a harsh scripture. Hold on to something. Now, Paul is talking about the sin and the division that has entered in to the New Testament congregation at Corinth. They were a mess, folks. There was, there was unspeakable sin going on. There were lawsuits against believers. And, and it, just, it just was a black eye. And Paul didn't like it. And, and his words are harsh. Here's his question. And the question is loaded. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. I think you is also plural in the Greek. So he's saying church, individuals that make up the church, don't you understand that you are the temple of God? What is the temple of God? It is a place that God makes himself available to fellowship, to live, to be with us. So Paul said, don't you know that's what we are? Listen to verse 17. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. That's harsh, isn't it? That's harsh. So you don't think God's zealous for his name? Do You don't think God's zealous for holiness? That kind of preaching wouldn't go over well today, would it? But I tell you that those words are as true today as they were the day he wrote them to the church at Corinth. God is holy, and his holiness dwells within every believer. And because of that, we have to be very careful. Now, in chapter 6, he gives us even more insight of 1 Corinthians. So, and, he, and, he, and again, he's talking to the church at Corinth, and they're... Uh, they have their issues, folks, okay? But I want you to hear what he says because I think it's important. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 20. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? So our bodies, that's individuals. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? You hear that? What's he saying? Oh, he said, by the way, certainly not. He said, you are Christ in you. Would you join a prostitute? That's what he's asking. Would you do that? He said, certainly you would not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So that unity... The same unity of, of, a, of a man and a woman uh, uh, in relations, that same oneness is our place in Christ. There's a unity spiritually for us, okay? Now, folks, I want to tell you, this is why God is so serious about it. Verse 18, flee sexual immorality. 
every sin that a man does is inside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Isn't that powerful? Whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you are bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, that leads us to a whole other sermon, and I'm not going to do it, but let me give you one thing to think about. We need to keep these bodies separate under the Lord. We need to be careful what goes in it. We need to be careful about how we take care of ourselves, but we certainly need to be careful about spiritual things that we allow or disallow. We don't do it for any other reason but for the glory of God. Folks, you don't think that'll keep you on a straight and narrow? <laughs> I bet it will. I bet it will, okay? So I think it's there, and I think it's something very important. So why should we be motivated? Why should we be motivated to yield our bodies unto the Lord because we were bought with a price? Well, it says right here. First and foremost, we have been purchased by God, and there was a very big price paid for us to be set free. What is that? It was the death of His Son. So for us to sin and, and basically taint the temple where the Holy Spirit lives, we have to disregard Jesus Christ dying for us. We have to say, I know you died for me, but I'm going to live for my flesh in spite of it. I'm going to yield to the flesh instead of dying to the flesh. And, and then these are the battles that we have. Also, we recognize that we yield to Jesus Christ because we are a part of His body. This work that He's building in this world, these living stones that Peter talks about, lively stones. We're the stones that are being built together into a spiritual edifice, if you will, that God is building. No, not, not, not this kind of building. It's a spiritual building. But let me tell you, every time we gather, and I know I preached last week, this isn't just a building, and it's not. This is a special place. But it's a special place because the church assembles here. Blood-bought believers in Christ gather here. And when we gather here for the right reasons, we are powerful folks, and we make quite an influence in this world. Another reason is, is we're responsible. Not only the fact that we were purchased with a price, but because of Jesus but also we have been commanded to come out and be separate from the sinfulness that would mar holiness. And we should be mindful of that. And I'm going to tell you one other one, too. Uh, Paul teaches this throughout Ephesians when we get to chapter 3. Well, actually, two sermons from now we'll talk a lot about it, but then in chapter 3 we'll see more of it. We have been saved and redeemed with Christ in us to love and serve each other. That's a function of the church. To esteem others is more important than ourselves, to find places of servant, to, to say, you know what, it's not about me. Everything is not about me. It's not what I want or don't want. I die to that, to live to Christ. Here I am, Lord, just use me up and then bring me home. That's our attitude. That's our attitude. Man, I get tired, don't you get tired? There's times that you just get worn out. And you go and you do and you get discouraged and you're disappointed and you want to quit, but you can't quit. Why? Because we were bought with a price and we have a very high call and we have a mission to accomplish. And we can't accomplish the mission if we're AWOL. We can't do it. We have to be present. And we have to recognize who we are. And knowing that we have people to serve is one of them, okay? Okay. So now, I think that we can take all of this now and we can look at ourselves as we function within West Union Baptist Church. We're a local congregation. We were kind of like an Ephesus. We're a group of believers located right here in this location. We have a physical location. We have a physical building. But that physical building houses the spiritual church. 
you guys on Sunday night, y'all are the faithful ones. Okay, and I appreciate you. I'm not calling out the choir here. I'm not condemning anybody. But the church is not functioning if half of them don't show up on even given Lord's Day. We're just not functioning. We're not the church that we're called to be, and we're not going to influence the dark world that we live in when Christians are dabbling in sin and being rebellious toward God. Do I have an answer for that? Oh, I have an answer for that. It's wholesale repentance, confession, and revival. And I can throw renewal in there too. And I think that this type of teaching leads me to that as a pastor. To pray anew and afresh. To pray for God to do a work that only God can do in the hearts and lives of his people. So I want to encourage you to take that to heart, okay? And I want to encourage you to find ways to minister within the congregation. Not to be seen, not to be recognized, not to be patted on the back, but out of a, a joyful obedience unto the Lord. I am a part of the body. Christ in me is the hope of glory. The Holy Spirit resides in me. I am a temple of Almighty God. What a difference that will make in our lives when we take that to heart. It will, folks. I'm telling you, it will. Let's bow together. Father, I ask you tonight to help us to understand these simple truths. Lord, they seem to be profound when we've never considered them. But Lord, when we really begin to think about them, they're very simple. You are doing a work. Thy kingdom come. It's coming. We're a part of that. Lord, there's evil all around us. There's darkness. The loved ones that we love that aren't saved are headed to destruction. And Lord, we cannot want it. We can will for it not to happen, but the truth is, apart from Christ, there will be no hope for anyone. And Lord, we get so wrapped up in life that we can take our eye off the game. We can take our eye off the war that we're in. We can take our eye off the responsibility that we hold. So Lord, I pray tonight that you would take this faithful group and that you would make us more faithful more committed, more driven to surrender and serve you and one another in the name of Jesus Christ until you return or you bring us home. And God, I ask all this for thy glory. And all of God's people said, amen, amen.